Father, we thank you tonight for this privilege and opportunity that we have to come into your presence in the middle of our week. Lord, just to be refreshed, just to be encouraged in your word. Lord, we just invite your Holy Spirit to have his way here tonight. God, give us wisdom and insight and understanding into your word. Help us to find ways that we can put it into practice in our lives. And Lord, we'll be quick to give you the glory and the praise for all that's done. In Jesus' name, amen.
Hallelujah. Lord, we want your presence in our lives. God, it's what makes a difference. God, in your presence is everything that we have need of tonight. Lord, we want to stay there. We want to be close to you tonight. Hallelujah.
God, it's our desire to please you. God, it's our desire to bless you tonight with our praise and our worship from a pure heart. God, we lift up holy hands because, God, you've made them holy through the blood of your son, Jesus. And Lord, we just pray that you'll accept our worship, God, that you'll accept our hearts cry tonight to you. Lord, that you'll move in this place, that your Holy Spirit would uh, challenge us, bring us deeper in the word tonight. God, that he'd have his way in our hearts and lives. God, give us ears to hear, hearts to respond to your word tonight. We give you the remainder of this Bible study. Teach us, make us a little bit more like Jesus tonight, we pray. We thank you for it. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Amen. We're going to continue our Bible study on the tabernacle, and we're going to be looking at chapter 9 tonight. And Brianna, can you come help me hand these out? Make sure everybody gets a packet. We are on chapter 9 of Brother Swaggart's book, The Tabernacle. We're using that as a springboard for our Bible study, also using some other resources as well. So, if you have a chance to get your hands on that book, The Tabernacle by Jimmy Swagger, you can go to shopjsm.org and pick it up for about $15. Uh, we don't have the time to cover everything that's in the book. We cover quite a bit, uh, but it would be a great resource to have, and it's going to show you who Jesus is. It's going to show you about his redemptive, atoning, mediatorial work that he's done for us, and it'll make you fall in love with Jesus a little bit more, and we hope that that's what you get uh, from tuning into our Bible studies as well on Wednesday night. All right, so we're going to be on chapter 9. I'm going to have Zoe go ahead and uh, set up the uh, Tabernacle app and get the sound adjusted. And uh, we'll start with that before we jump into the packets. And to, uh, chapter 9 is about the golden lampstand. And as soon as she's got that ready, we'll listen to Brother Swaggart's uh, commentary on the golden lampstand, and then we'll go into our packets tonight. The golden lampstand. Had you walked into the holy place of the tabernacle, as we stated earlier, you would to your right have seen the table of showbread, but to your left would be the golden lampstand called the menorah. It had seven prongs to it and three to the side. The middle prong represented the Lord Jesus Christ. The three prongs going into the side on either side totaling six represents man. Man's number is six. He never quite gets to seven unless he accepts Christ. And here's the remarkable thing about this golden lampstand. It was made out of one piece of gold. In other words, the, the prongs on the sides were not welded in. They were not screwed in, so to speak. It was all one piece of gold. We're told that craftsmen today could not make that particular type of lampstand, they would not know how. It typified Jesus Christ as the light of the world. He said to himself, I am the light of the world, and to be sure he is, typified by that golden lampstand. Every day, the priest had to come in and trim the wicks, and they would have to replenish the oil. I mean, every day, seven days a week, this had to be done because this was the only light in that tabernacle holy place. There was no other light, no windows, whatever, just the golden lampstand. There is no light except Christ. Understand that. He alone is the light of the entirety of the world. Jesus Christ, you must understand this, typified by the golden lampstand. All right, so that gives us a little bit of idea of uh, overview of what we're going to look at tonight. And uh, the golden lampstand, again, as you walk past that first curtain on the tabernacle, you would pass the curtain on the right was what? You've already studied it. Table of showbread. Jesus is the bread of 
life, right? Representing Jesus being our sustenance. Aren't you thankful? The, Jesus didn't just save you and then leave you. Jesus saves us and then he sustains us. He shows us how to live for God. He is how we live for God. is by continuing to keep our faith in that same God that saved us, that same Jesus that went to the cross to take away our sins, keeps us from going back into those sins. He's the bread of life. And then we talked about the altar of incense, which would have been right in front of you as you walked into the holy place from the core of the tabernacles, out where all the bloody sacrifice was. The brazen labor was outside. Once you got inside, there was none of that stench. There was none of that ugliness, which typified sin. But there was gold everywhere. Everything was beautiful, beautiful colors. Everything was clean inside the holy place. And this altar of incense that we talked about, and I believe in chapter 8, uh, was where uh, incense was put uh, and it stood right in front of the veil that separated the holy place from the holiest of holies. And again, it represents the intercession of Christ on our behalf. And that word intercession, when it's talking about Jesus, is not just talking about prayer. It's talking about Him standing in the gap. He's our mediator. He went between a holy God and sinful man, and He said, I'll be the substitute. I'll take the penalty for mankind's sin so that they could be restored back into harmony with the holy God. And so that incense that goes up was a perfume. And it was such a contrast with, with the stench of death that was outside. Because of man's sin, the fragrance of that frankincense and all those different spices on the altar of incense would have been something pleasant. It was a pleasing aroma, it says, in God's nostrils. And it also, in many scriptures in the Bible, it says the prayers of the saints are as sweet-smelling incense. Our intercession for our unsaved loved ones, our intercession for the will of God to be done in the day and age that we live in, it's all typified, of course, in Jesus, but also in that altar of incense. We can't enter into the very presence of God if we don't come first by way of the sacrifice and recognize that Jesus is our mediator. And then on the left would have been that candlestick, the, a golden lampstand, the golden candlestick. And so uh, we're going to look at that tonight. And if we have that PowerPoint, we can go ahead and we'll jump right into the packet tonight. I think we'll finish. It's a short chapter. <clears throat> but again, what does the candlestick represent? Jesus is what? He said it about himself. I am the light of the world, right? He that uh, walks in darkness can have the light of life because of Jesus. And so that's what we're looking at tonight. Let's look at Exodus 25. In verse 31, and we'll read that as our text to get started tonight again. Exodus 25 is where the description about the tabernacle begins. And it goes for several chapters after that. But Exodus 25, starting with verse 31, it talks about the golden candlestick. And you shall make a candlestick of pure gold. Of beaten work shall the candlestick be made. His shaft and his branches, his bowls, his knops, and his flowers shall be of the same. Alright? And so that's the first reference we have to the golden lampstand. Again, this wasn't in Moses' mind. This wasn't Moses' idea to, to construct this tabernacle. This was God's pattern, right? Salvation is not man's idea, although man has taken it upon himself to tinker with it from not just in these last days, but all along, man thinks we have something to contribute to it. But salvation is all of God and none of man. And that's what we can see in the tabernacle. This wasn't Moses' idea. It wasn't his, his workman's idea. It was God's idea. And he gave them the ability and the skill to build these different things. And they all, again, pointed to who Jesus would be, the Messiah in the future. They all pointed to the redemptive work that he would do. Uh, in, the, in the New Covenant in years to come. Alright, so let's look at uh, uh, these paragraphs, the commentary in the, in the packet tonight. The lampstand, unlike many of the other vessels in the tabernacle, was made of pure gold. What were some of the other vessels made out of? Wood, right? Acacia wood, hard wood, durable wood, and then they were covered with gold. But this had no acacia wood in it. It was pure gold. And that would be something that would, as you can imagine, be very beautiful to look at. The Hebrew word menorah means light bearer and should have been translated lampstand instead of candlestick. 
Okay, it didn't really hold candles, although at uh, Hanukkah, in the Jewish tradition, they have, uh, oftentimes they have candles. The menorah was actually a lampstand. It didn't hold candles. It had an oil and a wick and tubes that would, if you would, that would hold uh, the wick so that they could be lit. So lampstand is probably a better translation, really, than candlestick. But some English translations use that word candlestick. All right, the only source of light, as Brother Swaggart shared in his commentary on the lampstand, uh, Jesus is the light. The, the lampstand in the holy place was the only thing that allowed light to come in there. Remember all the skins that covered the tabernacle that we talked about earlier? There was no window. Everything covered the inside to the ground, these skins. And so the only time light would be let in is when they opened the curtain to walk in, but then when they closed the curtain behind them, there would be no light if it wasn't for the lampstand. And so that pictures the only source of light. The lampstand was the only source of light in the entirety of the holy place. And the lampstand is a type foreshadowing of Christ as the light of the world, whether in his earthly ministry pertaining to his first advent when he came the first time, or through his church. All right, while, while believers are the light of the world, presently we are such light only as a reflection of Christ. Right, Matthew 5, 14 says that you are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Amen, God wants us to shine the light of Jesus Christ that reflection of His glory that shines into our lives, He wants us to shine that in this dark world. And all it takes is just a flicker of light, doesn't it? To pierce the darkness. Jesus is the light of the world. If we're Christian, if we're Christ-like, if we're fully devoted Christ followers, we ought to have the light of Jesus reflecting every day from our thoughts, our attitudes, our actions, amen? And letting this dark world see uh, the light of Jesus. The lampstand as well portrays the Holy Spirit typified by the oil in His work with, within and upon Christ. Luke chapter 4 The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because He has anointed me to preach deliverance to the captives, recovering of sight to the blind, setting at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. That was the ministry of Jesus but it was only brought about by the Holy Spirit. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. That's what the oil in the lampstand represents. is the Holy Spirit anointing the work of Christ. And it's the same in our lives today as believers. Don't we need the anointing of the Holy Spirit in 2018? We, we can place our faith in Jesus and the work, the finished work that Jesus did. Aren't you thankful that it was enough? His blood was enough. His sacrifice was enough to set people free from their sins, to deliver us, to heal us, to give us a hope of heaven, all that Calvary affords us, but we need the Holy Spirit's anointing to help us proclaim that to others, and minister to others, and we can see that all represented, all typified, all foreshadowed in this golden lampstand uh, that we are looking at here in the tabernacle. All right, it says it was of beaten work. And the word beaten refers to the fact that the lampstand was not cast in a mold. All right? It was somebody who worked with gold, and they used hammers, they used tools to beat this one piece of gold into the golden can candlestick or the golden lampstand. So that was different than a lot of the other pieces in the tabernacle. It was not cast in a mold, but was rather fashioned by hand. Jesus was absolutely without sin in every capacity. That means in his life and living, he never sinned even one time, whether by word, thought, or deed. Think about that. Do we believe that? Jesus never sinned. If we don't believe that, then we have a problem because Jesus' sacrifice wasn't sufficient to bridge the gap between a holy God and sinful man. But Jesus never sinned even one time, whether by word, thought, or deed. No other human being could say such a thing. And yet when we accept Him, when we accept Jesus as our Savior, He freely awards us His perfection. Amen? That's why we're acceptable to God the Father. It's not because we're perfect. Christians aren't perfect. Amen? There's a bumper sticker that says Christians aren't perfect. They're just forgiven. 
that shouldn't be uh, an excuse for you to go out and do stupid things. Amen? <laughs> but we receive His perfection, Christ's perfection, because of what He did for us at the cross. He made that grace available to us. He shared His victory with us. So when we see the middle stem of the lampstand, we are seeing Christ. Christ is what that middle stem represents. But more so, we are seeing the perfection of Christ. Right? He was perfect. Everything stems from Him, right? In the menorah, everything stemmed from that center piece on that lampstand. And that's a picture of our relationship with God. It has to be through Jesus Christ, right? And that's what we can see in this, uh, this golden lampstand. All right, the suffering of Christ. Beaten speaks of the suffering of Christ. And by that, we refer to the cross. You read a physician's account, you can go on uh, Google or uh, different search engines on the internet and look up a physician's account of what a crucifixion victim would have gone through in Roman times. I have a, a printout that I was given many years ago from a physician's, a secular physician's account of what Jesus as a man would have gone through and what a crucifixion victim goes through. Most people don't realize that a crucifixion victim died from suffocation, from their internal organs filling up with fluids. And they would, because they could not pull themselves up, because in Jesus, in Jesus' case, his hands and his feet were nailed, he, could not, he had to pull themselves up just to breathe, to get their lungs up over that liquid that was filling up in the inside of them. And eventually they died from suffocation. We know Jesus didn't die that way. He laid down his life as a sacrifice. But a crucifixion victim, think about it, Jesus seven times pulled himself up on those nails so he could breathe enough to say significant words to us. It is finished, amen, maybe, maybe the most significant words that he said. But imagine, imagine the excruciating pain, the suffering Christ went through. This beaten work of the lampstand represented the sufferings of Christ and certainly what he went through when he was on the cross. He is now glorified. And has done so as a reward of his perfect but painful work. He endured pain, he endured suffering so that we wouldn't have to. Amen? Because of our sins. We ought to thank God for that each and every day. But that's what was represented by this lampstand being a beaten work. One piece of gold that was beaten and shaped into this golden lampstand. Philippians chapter 2 verses 8 and 9 refers to what this is talking about here. And being found in fashion as a man, he, Jesus, humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Amen. Jesus was obedient. Wherefore God also has highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every other name. Jesus didn't stay on the cross. He was taken down. He was put into the tomb. And we know that three days later he rose again. And we know that he was made himself available and was witnessed by over 500 eyewitnesses before his ascension, and then he ascended back to the right hand of the Father. And that's why he is highly exalted, and he's given a name that is above every name. His sufferings were for a purpose, to save humanity, to set us free from our sins. And that's what's represented, again, in this golden lampstand. He is creator, but due to his atoning work, on the cross of Calvary, he is also now Savior, which makes him more exalted than ever before. Hebrews chapter 1, and then what we just read in Philippians. How could Jesus be exalted even more? He was already God, right? But he became flesh, and now he's not only our Creator God, who spoke the worlds in existence, and all the things we read about in Genesis, the creation, but now he's also our Savior. So that's how uh, he's more exalted than ever before. Because he brought us back to God. Amen. We alienated ourselves from God by our rebellion, by our sin, by our disobedience. But Jesus is highly exalted because he not only was our creator, he was not only God, but he became flesh to be our Savior. And so now he is in an exalted place. All right. The bowls, the knops, and the flowers. The bowls or cups form the first ornament on each branch and are likened to almonds 
which signify the resurrection. Number 17 talks about that as well. Talks about the resurrection. The knops could have been translated pomegranates, which speak of fruit. God wants there to be fruit in our lives. Evidence on the outside of us that God is doing something on the inside of us, right? You can look at trees this time of year in Colorado. If you looked at an apple tree, a pear tree, and what's another one that looks similar? They look pretty similar in wintertime when there's no leaves and no fruit on them, right? They just look like trunks with twigs, <laughs> right? Unless you're a real good uh, person with plants, you wouldn't be able to tell the difference. But how do you know what kind of tree they are? Well, when it becomes spring and they begin to put their leaves out again and the buds begin to blossom and the fruit begins to show up, then you know, okay, this is an apple tree, or this is a pear tree, or this is an uh, orange tree, whatever uh, different trees look the same. And that's the same in our spiritual lives. How do we know uh, what kind of person we are, what kind of uh, person of faith we are? Well, it's when God begins to show on the outside with the work that He's been doing on the inside of us. That's fruit. That's evidence. That's proof. And that's what those pomegranates uh, speak of. The flowers could have been translated lilies. And they speak of purity. All right? Lilies always speak of purity. God wants there to be purity in our walk with Him. Blessed are the pure in heart for what? They shall see God. That's not just one day in heaven. That's now. Amen? We'll see God show up in our circumstances now as well as when we get to heaven. But we've got to have the purity of Christ in our lives if we're going to have that happen. Alright? Fruit. As Christ now lives through the believer and thereby is aided by the Holy Spirit, even as the believer maintains his faith in the finished work of Christ, he now begins to bring forth fruit. Okay? Who helps us as we place our faith in Jesus and the cross? The Holy Spirit. It's the fruit of the Spirit. It's not your fruit. It's not my fruit. Right? Paint, love, love, joy, peace, patience, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, gentleness, self-control. Those things are not something we're born with. They're the fruit, the evidence, the proof of the Holy Spirit coming in and changing us. And so our responsibility is to believe in Jesus. Lord, I believe you. I believe that your work on the cross was a finished work. God, I don't believe there's anything I can add to what you did for me at the cross. And when we place our faith there and we keep it there, then the Holy Spirit comes and helps produce evidence, fruit, proof in our lives that we belong to Jesus. All right, John 15, verse 5. Think about this verse when you're thinking about the menorah and that center stem being Jesus and all the other branches of that menorah stem off of the central one. Jesus said in John 15, 5, I am the vine, you are the branches. He that abides in me and I in him, the same brings forth much fruit. For without me you can do nothing. Alright, we're all connected to Jesus. We're all one body of Christ, not screwed into Jesus, right? Not welded on to Jesus, but we're an extension of Jesus. That one beaten work is what the candlestick was. One piece of gold. And we're, when we're in Christ, he's the vine. We're the branches. He gives us what we need every day. Amen? And we can bear much fruit. We can have a lot of evidence of Christ and God's glory in our lives as long as we stay connected to Jesus. And that's what our daily walk should look like. All right? The lily speaks of purity, which one can have only as one looks totally to Christ. All right? That word purity means unmixed. If you ever took chemistry... In high school, there's elements that are pure elements. It means they're unmixed. There's no alloys. There's no other things mixed in with them. They're 100% pure. If we're going to have purity in our lives, free from sin, free from an admixture, wrong things in our lives mixed in, we've got to look totally to Christ and what Christ has done at the cross. That's the only way that we can be pure. The individual cannot make himself pure. There's no soap on the planet that can wash away our sin stains. Amen? There's no self-effort. There's no seven habits, twelve steps, 
40 days of whatever that can purify our hearts. Only what Jesus did for us at the cross can, can cleanse us and make us pure. Uh, the individual cannot make himself pure, that being a work entirely of the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit can't do the work until we place our faith in Jesus Christ and Him crucified. His hands are tied until we say, God, I believe in your redemption plan. I, re I believe in the redemption plan of your only Son coming, your only beloved Son coming and dying in my place that I might be free. And that's how we can be made pure. And that lily can be a representation of what Jesus has done in our life. All right, let's look at Exodus 25, verse 32. The next verse, uh, talking about the candlesticks. As candlestick. Uh, Exodus 25, verse 32. And six branches shall come out of the sides of it. Three branches of the lampstand out of the one side. And three branches of the lampstand out of the other side. How many total branches does that make? But counting the center one, seven. seven. Seven represents what? Perfection, right? Completeness. Seven days of creation. Uh, all the different things that are represented by seven in reference to God shows perfection. And so there's seven branches, including the stem, the centerpiece, in this golden lampstand. All right, branches. It had three branches to the side, totaling six, which is the number of man. Six is always representative of man. Remember, what is the Antichrist number going to be that he wants on your forehead or your wrist? Six, six, six. So the number of man three times. He's supposed to be the ultimate man. We know what happens to him, though. He doesn't win. But that number six is the number of man. And which is the body of Christ, whether Israel or the church. So these six branches represent man, human beings, humankind. And we're all connected to what? The center stem, Jesus. Whether it's Israel or whether it's the church. Actually, in Christ, we have all been made both one, Ephesians chapter 2. Whether it's the Jews or whether we're talking about the church, the only way we can uh, enjoy God's presence is to be in Christ. And the Jews are going to have one more chance, amen, during the great tribulation to make Jesus their Messiah and they can be in Christ just like we are as a church today. These branches were not welded or fastened to the side of the main stem, but were rather a part of the main stem. This speaks of our being in Christ. All right? We need to stay in Christ. We, we come into covenant relationship with God by being in Christ, and we stay in in covenant relationship with God by remaining in Christ. Alright? Keeping our faith in Jesus and the cross. Not letting the object of our faith shift to something else. To a lesser love. To religion or to a preacher or to a work or effort of our own hands. We always keep the object of our faith as Jesus Christ and Him crucified. We can stay in Christ. All right, we are in Christ as stated by virtue of being baptized into his death. Romans chapter 6, buried with him by baptism into death. So in other words, when Jesus died 2,000 years ago, that's what this is talking about, it's as if, if I'm identified with Christ, he's my Savior, he's my Lord, it's as if my old sinful nature died with him. I consider it as dead, just as Jesus died on the cross 2,000 years ago. I was baptized into his death, buried with him by baptism into death, and then if I was buried with him and I died with him, I also am raised with him in the newness of life. You can only have resurrection life, Romans chapter 6, if you first considered yourself as your old sinful nature as dying with Jesus on the cross. Does that make sense? So, so many people in the modern church want to talk about having resurrection life, resurrection power, but they deny the cross. You can't have resurrection power without first dying to self, denying self, and going by way of the cross. All right, and in this verse, there's so much confusion in a lot of the modern church. He wasn't speaking of water baptism, but rather being baptized into Christ. That word baptized in the original language, it means an immersion totally submerged, totally surrounded and enveloped. And that's a picture of our relationship, being in Christ. We're totally submerged, totally immersed 
in who Jesus is and what he's done for us. We're baptized into Christ. And that can only happen, it only comes by faith, right? By faith, Lord, I believe. You made a way for me to be hidden in Christ through your death upon the cross. It takes place when we are born again. Remember what Jesus told Nicodemus, John chapter 3. You cannot inherit the kingdom of God unless you are born again. You cannot even see the kingdom of God unless you are born again. And that means uh, a new heart, amen, a new creation in Christ Jesus. Without proper faith in the cross, there is no union with Christ as should be obvious. You're alienated, you're afar off, you're distant from God, unless you have proper faith in Jesus and the cross. All right, let's look at Exodus 25, verse 33. Exodus 25, verse 33. Three bowls made like unto almonds, with a knot and a flower in one branch, and three bowls made like almonds in the other branch, with a knot and a flower, so in the six branches that come out, of a lampstand. Alright? And uh, so this is talking about the appearance of the branches. These, this is a beautiful lampstand with the ornamentation. Can you imagine how difficult it would have been to fashion that, to make that out of one piece of gold? But the appearance of the branches, we must ever understand that we have resurrection life only as we understand the crucifixion and what it means to us. We better get a hold of what it means to die to self, to de deny self, to be identified with Christ in His death so that we can be identified with Him in resurrection life. If we properly understand the cross, we will have resurrection life and we will have the fruit of the Spirit typified by the pomegranates which will be developed in our lives which will always result in purity. I was listening to the Christian radio on the way to work this morning with Tanya, and they were talking about how can we get one of the particular fruits of the Spirit, I forget what it was, I think it was patience, and how, how, what can you do to uh, develop more patience in your life? Well, the whole problem is we're going about it the wrong way. We can't develop patience in our lives. You can change your behavior, you can change your habits, but what does the Word of God say? It's a fruit of of the Spirit. It's the Holy Spirit that has to improve your lack of patience, my lack of patience. Amen? And that's how we improve it, is by dying to self and going to Jesus and the cross and saying, God, I can't do this. You've got to do it. But of course, that's not what they said on the Christian radio program. We try and make these things happen. But it's a fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control. You can't make those things happen. It's something that as you yield to Christ, you place your faith in Jesus and the cross, the Holy Spirit will then begin to manifest the fruit of the Spirit. You'll love like you never did before. You'll have joy like you never had before. You'll find yourself more patient than you've ever been. And it's not because of you pulling yourself up by your bootstraps or changing your habits. It's by you yielding to Christ and what He did for you at the cross. Amen? And that's typified by the pomegranates. We need the fruit of the Spirit. As much as we need the gifts of the Spirit in these last days, tongues and interpretation of tongues, prophecy, words of wisdom, healing, faith, miracles, we want all of those things, right? The demonstrations of God's power confirming His Word. As much as we want that, we need the fruit of the Spirit even more. God doing the work of His Holy Spirit in our hearts and lives to make us look a little bit more like Christ. But that, that fruit of the Spirit will be developed in our lives, which will always result in purity represented by the lily. That is the flower. Okay, so those are the different ornamental pieces on each of the six branches. The flowers, the knops, the almonds, those are all representative of who Jesus is and what He's done for us. Alright, let's look at Exodus 25, verse 34. It says this, And in the lampstand shall be four bowls made like unto almonds, with their knops and their flowers. Alright? The central shaft. There was four bowls, four knops, and four flowers. This totaled up to what? Twelve ornaments. And twelve in the Word of God, especially when it's in reference to, to God or to Jesus, spoke of the government of Christ. The perfect government. He had how many apostles? Twelve. How many tribes of Israel? Twelve. 
And so we know that 12 represents the government of Christ. And we can see that in this golden lampstand. This tells us that his government has the cross as its foundation, which will produce much fruit and much purity. So you can say the opposite of that, can't you? Put that back up there for a second. That last slide if you can. The opposite of that last paragraph. If we don't have the cross as our foundation in how we govern our lives, then we won't have much fruit and we won't have much purity, right? And so we better understand uh, what, what's represented there, all right? Five ornaments on each stem, three bowls with one knob and one flower. Five is the number of grace. All right, grace. Grace is simply the goodness of God extended to undeserving people. And the vehicle that brings grace to us is the Holy Spirit. That's why you better not quench the Spirit. Amen? You better not grieve the Holy Spirit. You better not certainly blaspheme the Holy Spirit. Because if you do, you don't have a vehicle from God to bring grace to you. And so it's... Grace is simply the goodness of God extended to undeserving people, and that happens by the work of the Holy Spirit. And that's what's represented by those five ornaments. All right, Exodus 25, verses 35 and 36. And there shall be a knop under two branches of the same, and a knop under two branches of the same, and a knop under two branches of the same, according to the six branches that proceed out of the lampstand. Their knops and their branches shall be of the same, all it shall be one beaten work of pure gold. Alright, so again we see some things about the branches. This tells us that all believers can enjoy resurrection life, bear fruit, and develop purity. That's God's plan. Of, of course all of this is a work of the Holy Spirit which we shall see. Alright, it's not because you went to church enough times that you became pure. It's because the Holy Spirit came in and made you pure because of your faith in Jesus and the cross. It's not anything about us. Salvation is all of God and none of man. And we can see that represented in these uh, different branches on the golden lampstand. All right, Exodus 25, verses 37 through 40. It says, And you shall make the seven lamps thereof, and they shall light the lamps thereof, that they may give light over against it. And the tongs thereof and the snuff dishes thereof shall be of pure gold. Of a talent of pure gold shall he make it with all these vessels. And look that you make them after their pattern which was showed you in the mount. Okay, so Moses was given a revelation of what he was to make. Again, salvation is all of God and none of man. It wasn't Moses' idea, it was God's idea for the tabernacle. Just as salvation is all... God's idea, nothing to do with man. These seven, the, the seven lamps, there were seven of these lamps which speaks of perfect illumination. That number seven is perfection, completion. So these seven lamps speak of perfect illumination, which only the Holy Spirit can, can do. Only the Holy Spirit can bring perfect illumination. If we follow Him, talking about the Holy Spirit, we will have a perfect leading. Amen. I believe it's Galatians that says if we walk in the Spirit, we'll not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. Amen. He gives us a perfect leading. We need to be Spirit-led, Spirit-empowered, Spirit-baptized believers in these last days so we can uh, follow God appropriately. A talent of pure gold weighed about 120 pounds. Imagine that. We look at the price of gold in our economy right now, it's skyrocketing, the value of gold. But at 16 ounces to the pound, we come up with 1,920 ounces. That's this golden lampstand. At $1,500 per ounce, it's probably more than that now, because gold has continued to go up. We have a total of about $2,880,000 is what this golden lampstand would have been valued at. Talking about, think again what this lampstand is representing. Jesus as the light of the world. How invaluable is that in our life? His illumination, the perfect illumination of the Holy Spirit because of our faith in Jesus, the light of the world. It's something that we should treasure, amen? When God opens up the scriptures and gives us illumination for the next step we ought to take in our life, 
or he shows us something down the road, we ought to praise God because there's no value that you can put on that illumination. Amen? Jesus is the light of the world. If it wasn't for Christ, we'd be groping around in the darkness like we did before we got saved. But you can see the value of this golden lampstand was astronomical. It would have been the present cost of gold as it regards a lampstand, almost $3 million. And of course, this book was, was written about a year or so ago. It's probably gone up since then. This is showing that the value of God's light in our life, you can't put a price on it. Amen? It's valuable. The pattern. This tells us that the work of the Spirit in our hearts and lives must be carried out strictly on God's terms and His terms alone. Okay? We don't get to instruct God. We don't get to dictate to Him how we think things ought to happen. And sometimes our prayers aren't answered because that's what we're doing in our prayers. Is telling God how He ought to operate. We need to remember that we operate on God's terms. Amen? And His terms alone. It was His pattern. His pattern is the cross and our faith in that finished work. We must understand that the moment we attempt to put our own strength and ability into the mix, we have wrecked the victory that we could have. A lot of people are living in that place. Thinking they're helping God out putting God in the passenger seat and saying, God, let me drive for a little while. I know how to do this. And then we end up in the ditch with our car wrecked. And we're like, okay, Jesus, fix this. You can drive again, right? Should have left him in the driver's seat to begin with. When we mix our own strength and our own ability into the mix, we lose the victory that Jesus won for us at the cross. He doesn't need anything from us except our faith. The Holy Spirit will not function in that capacity whatsoever. He demands that we exhibit faith exclusively in Christ and the cross, which gives him the ability to work within our lives and which can guarantees victory in every capacity. In this manner, in this manner alone, we can have what we should have in the Lord as believers, which refers to victory. And when we talk about victory, we're not talking about winning in everything we do, never losing. That's not the life of a Christian. There's times when we you know, we lose, we have bad things happen to us, but we're talking about victory over the world, the world system, victory over the flesh, our old sinful nature, and victory over the devil. And those are some references that talk about that. That's the victory that Jesus purchased for us and that he shares with us by our faith in what he did at the cross. And we should be living in that victory every day of our lives, growing and experiencing all that God has for us. All right, you have boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus. You are a priest unto God. The showbread is yours. Your place is at the pure table to feed on the priestly food in the light of the Holy Ghost. All right, as a believer, you have those rights. Nothing can ever deprive you of those divine privileges. They are yours forever. Let it be your care to watch against everything that might rob you of the enjoyment of them. Beware of unhallowed tempers, lusts, feelings, and imaginations. Keep the world out. Boy, that's a message that needs to be preached to the modern church, isn't it? Keep the world out. Don't invite them in. Don't make them feel comfortable in your church, but keep the world out. Keep the world out of your life. Keep Satan off. May the Holy Ghost fill your whole soul with Christ. Then you will be practically holy and abidingly happy. You will bear fruit, and the Father will be glorified, and your joy shall be full. We should be enjoying the different parts of the holy place. Jesus being our bread of life, our sustenance. Jesus being our intercessor, represented by the altar of incense. Jesus being the light of the world, shining not just once when we get saved, but continually illuminating perfectly our life the Holy Spirit helping as well to illuminate our footsteps so that we can become more like Jesus every day. And then we can be happy. And then we can have a fruitful Christian life, a victorious Christian life. And that should be ours. We shouldn't be letting the enemy steal that from us. All right, look at this quote. The church is still dark as the tabernacle was in comparison with what it will be in heaven. But the word of God is the candlestick a light shining in a dark place, 2 Peter 1.19, and a dark place indeed the world would be without it. 
The Spirit of God and His various gifts and graces is compared to the seven lamps which burn before the throne, Revelation 4, 5. The churches are golden candlesticks, the lights of the world holding forth the word of life as a candlestick does the light, Philippians 2, 15 and 16. Ministers are to light the lamps and to snuff them, trim them, keep them burning brightly by opening the scriptures. Amen? We need to be making sure the light. Can we go back one slide? Actually, two slides. Two slides. But the word of God needs to be what's lighting this dark world. Amen? We need to be as believers, sharing the word of God every opportunity that God gives us. We need to be the church in these last days, not coming together less in these last days, but coming together more so that our lights together can shine brightly in a dark community that's lost in sin, that's broken, that's desperate, looking for answers. We have the answer. His name is Jesus. Amen. He is the light of the world, and He wants to illuminate our path, show us the way we ought to walk, and that's what's represented all in this golden lampstand. Long before Jesus was ever born, this lampstand was a representation of who He would be and what He would do for us through His atoning work on the cross. And thank God for that tonight.